to be a waste of time and a waste of effort in the end starts leading somewhere. And my God, it's leading somewhere now as humanity starts to wake up increasingly in vaster and vaster numbers to remember the full magnitude of who we are. <laughs> I'd like to thank um, Adam and all the team for putting this event on so magnificently. And I, I just ask uh, one thing of you. I want no discord today. Well, actually, you can have discord. Just don't blame me for it, okay? Because uh, I'll tell you for why. A um, few days ago, I turned up at immigration at Melbourne Airport. 20-hour flight, knackered, and I'm standing there and in the line, and I go over with my passport, and it was amazing because she stamped it immediately, and I thought, that was quick, no questions. And I'm, at, I'm waiting for it to come back, and she turned around and gave it to some guy who was waiting behind. Would you, would you go with this gentleman, sir? I've heard those words before, <laughs> many times. <laughs> and so I followed this fella. They were very nice, very courteous. And he takes me into this, these back rooms and hands me over to this lady, takes me into this kind of bright white room, like an Agent Smith type room. <laughs> and um, and she, she puts this document in front of me that I have to sign to say that I've read it. And um, it said a, a number of things, but this is the key thing. Section 501 of the Migration Act 1958, the Act, provides a discretionary power to refuse to grant or to cancel a visa if a non-citizen does not meet the requirements of the character test. <laughs> Moi? Moi? A non-citizen will not meet the requirements of the character test if, among other things, there is significant risk that they will vilify, incite discord, <laughs> in or represent a danger to the Australian community or segment of the Australian community. I think it's a good idea. I think we ought to expand it. I think we ought to have a character test for government ministers and officials. Reckon? I think so. I think so. Because if we did, Canberra would be a bloody ghost town, wouldn't it? And Westminster and Washington and all of them. Character test. Discord. Definition of discord. Uh, lack of agreement among persons, groups, or things. Oh, call the bloody army out. <laughs> Mustn't incite that. Tension or strife resulting from a lack of agreement, dissension. Well, that shut parliament down for a sodding start, didn't it? <laughs> a confused or harsh sound or mingling of sounds. Parliament again, there you go. <laughs> and finally, uh, inharmonious combination of simultaneously sounded tones a dissonance. So if anyone's got a trumpet, play it in tune, or I'm in the crap here, okay, <laughs> with the government. I don't know. And of course, like all this legislation, terrorist legislation, which doesn't define terrorist, this can be defined by the minister who makes the decision, according to this document, um, in any way they bloody like. But, as you know, I am someone who is known to bow to authority and bow the head, so I'd like to say that um, I take the warning extremely seriously, okay? <laughs> I take the document extremely seriously, and I've thought of nothing else. I shall watch every word I say today. <laughs> you got a bloody laugh. It's so daft. And I guess... Um, there will be someone in the audience who's come to monitor what I say, otherwise there's no point in signing the document. And uh, I'd just like to welcome them, <laughs> wherever they are. <laughs> and uh, I really do uh, hope that by the end of the day, they will have found it within themselves to get a life. <laughs> and then... And then their children and grandchildren might be proud of them instead of asking them, Mummy, Daddy, what were you doing when this state came in that now controls every area of my life? Oh, I was helping to do it, dear. 
Yeah, okay. My God, do we need this or what? The whole theme of today is to free our minds. It actually is more than that, as I'll come to. Free our minds from the programming that turns infinite consciousness, having an experience, into a four-legged animal from which we get wool that have lost the ability to decide perception and reality for themselves and have to have it decided for them. Without that, the few couldn't control the many. With it, it's a piece of cake. This is uh, Wilhelm Reich setting the tone for the day, an inventor and researcher and psychologist. He said this, Am I a spaceman? Do I belong to a new race on earth, bred by men from outer space in embraces with earth women? I request my right and privilege to have such thoughts and ask such questions without being threatened to be jailed by any administrative agency of society. In the face of a rigid, doctrinaire, self-appointed, ready-to-kill hierarchy of scientific censorship, it appears foolish to publish such thoughts. Anyone malignant enough could do anything with them. Still, the right to be wrong has to be maintained. Massive, basic human right, the right to be wrong. We should not fear to enter a forest because there are wild cats around in the trees. We should not yield our right to well-controlled speculation. It is certain questions entailed in such speculation which administrators of established knowledge fear. But in entering the cosmic age, we should certainly insist on the right to ask new, even silly questions without being molested. And I demand that right for myself, and no men in dark suits or uniforms are going to deny me that, for I am consciousness, not some clone of some idiotic brain-dead system that seeks to tell me who I am, what I am, and what I can and cannot do with my own mind. So, when we open our mind, or go beyond that even, then we start to see reality in a different way. This is a wonderful quote. You were born an original, don't die a copy. So many people do that. They go through their lives thinking the norm in society is the only possible perception of reality. And because the majority appear to believe it, therefore, by definition, it must be true. Truth does not change because it is or is not believed by the majority of the people. As Gandhi said, even if you are in a minority of one, the truth is still the truth. Or as this proverb says, the multitude is always wrong. And invariably, when you look through what we call history, it turns out that way. It is the people who have challenged that that have moved us forward in terms of our understanding of who we are and the nature of the world we live in. A few centuries ago, the majority believed. Why? Because those people perceived to be all-knowing the scientists and religious people of the day said the earth was flat and if you went too far, you'd fall off the edge. And people were jailed and vilified for saying, actually, it's a sphere. And then when the evidence becomes overwhelming that the earth is actually a sphere, then that becomes the new norm and now anyone who says that it's flat, is now ridiculed for believing that. The difference is, what is the norm accepted in society at any one time? And that's the truth that people follow. We live in a world of conflict and war and famine, where people, are, a few people, are control and hijack the wealth at the expense of the vast majority. 
We live in a world which, take a step back, deep breath, look at it again, is utterly bloody insane. And we're asked to believe, and so many people do, that we are somehow at the cutting edge of human evolution. We're nowhere near the edge of what is possible and what is there to be known. But the norms are very powerful, especially when, from cradle to grave, we are constantly manipulated and confused with contradictory information, and when we're pressured to believe it, otherwise we'll get ridiculed or condemned for being different. We are in a a situation, a world brilliantly uh, described by this man, Michael Elner. Just look at us. Everything is backwards. Everything is upside down. Doctors destroy health. Lawyers destroy justice. Universities destroy knowledge. Governments destroy freedom. The major media destroys information. And religions destroy spirituality. That's where we are. So we live in an upside down world. Why? That's what I asked 20 years ago. And the answers are uh, amazing when you start to take back the, <laughs> take back the uh, camouflage that's put before us. All the way through our lives, we are being given instructions, we're being given directions, and basically the world has been turned into a maze of confusion. And it's done to keep us from the simple truths. Because complexity is there to stop us finding those simple truths. But when you connect the dots between apparently unconnected people, situations, organizations, world events, and you start to see how they fit together, suddenly this bewildering, confusing world starts to take on a much clearer dimension. Because only by connecting the dots over, as you'll see today, a vast range of subjects and situations and people can you start to see why the world is upside down, why it is as it is. And crucially, behind that complexity, those smoke screens of complexity, why behind that is an amazing revelation of who we are and the nature of life, when we start to realize that far from being Ethel Jones or Billy Smith, we are all that is, has been, and ever will be. That is the difference between who we are and who we are manipulated to believe we are. And when you connect those dots more and more, And it's like putting a a jigsaw puzzle together. It is putting a jigsaw puzzle together. When uh, When I first started doing it, what I was looking for was those straight bits that make up the the frame. And in terms of what I'm doing, that was understanding the structure through which a few can control the many. And then as you keep putting more, at the start, it's like, where the bloody hell does this go? What's this? Oh, my God, it's so confusing. The more you put the pieces together and the picture appears, the quicker you can put the pieces in because you start to see um, what the game is. And the elephant in the living room is that there are two streams of reality going on together. One is a secret agenda to create a global fascist centralized dictatorship to dictate to and control on every level every man, woman, and child on the planet. Going alongside that is what I call the movie. That's the version of the world that we are given through the mainstream media, through what we call education. And that 
is to explain away the changes going on, which are actually the agenda coming in in a coordinated way, but the move is there to explain them away in an ungood co coordinated fashion so we don't see where it's really going. Those days for so many people are now over because we can see where it's going, where it wants to go. And key to everything, and that's what I'm really going to concentrate on in the first half, uh, or first third, three sections today. The key to everything else in this global conspiracy is to put humanity into a false identity. A false belief in who we are. It has to get us to see ourselves in terms of little me, powerlessness, what can I do? I'm just Joe Public, and I'm just Ethel Jones or Charlie Smith. That's who I am. I'm the reflection in the mirror. That's me. I have no power. When in fact, we are infinite consciousness having an experience as Charlie Smith or Ethel Jones. But what the manipulation has to do to put us in the box of mass control is to persuade us that we are the experience. And they've done it brilliantly so far. And when we accept that, this is the state that we're put in energetically, what I call the eggshell. Instead of accessing the infinity of knowledge, understanding, awareness, love, all knowing that it is possible to access, because that's who we are, we close down, and what do we say? We close our minds. We close our minds and we operate on a fraction of who we are. Compared with the infinity of who we are, we close in on a fraction that is nothing less than the village idiot by comparison. And only by putting us in this state of a consciousness, if you can call it that, state of mind, more accurate, can the few control the many on the scale that they have and do. You know, I, I have this thing, I just mentioned it a few minutes ago, when you, you go, we get so close to things, and, and therefore they become so normal that we never question them. Take a deep breath, take a step back, look at it again. Look at life. Someone said to me the other day, um, in fact, they've said to me many times over the years, similar things. What's life all about? I mean, you're born, and then you, you, you grow, you go to school, and then you go to college and they teach things and stuff, and then you get a job. Most of the time, it's a job you don't like. Does you know, gives you no satisfaction, but you do it because you have to do it because you have to earn money to, 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 to live and survive. And then you get older, and you, you kind of had children, and they go the same thing. And then, and then you, you, you get even older, and then your body starts to go, and you start getting pains, and it's more difficult, and then you've got lots of health problems, stuff like that, and, and then you die. <laughs> you know. And, and if you've pleased some guy with a beard or whatever then you go to a nice place when you die, and if you haven't, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> and you look at it, and people don't live overwhelmingly. They exist. They stay alive between point A and point Z. And this is life. I think we can do better than that. The reason that's what life has become is because we have become people who have, uh, who live not a life, but a program, a computer program that follows uh, 
the program through what we call life. And instead of living life, we let life live us, the program live us. And the program is working all the time to keep us in a hypnotic state, because that's, as I'll come to, is basically where most people are at, in a hypnotic state, and it's, it's, it's incessant. Tick tock, you are feeling sleepy. You have no power. You must serve the system. It's a mind game. It has to be a mind game because there's not enough manipulators to physically control the population, so they have to do it through mind, through perception. And through that, by the way, get the population to police each other. They put us in prisons of the mind where we, we instead of expanding out to all possibility, we have these belief systems which are nothing more than programs, computer programs, religion, politics, race, self-identity. We are all that is, has uh, ever been, will ever be, and yet once you take on a religion, that goes zoom. Or oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim, I follow Judaism, and I'm Hindu. <laughs> Boom! Rules, regulations. You can't say that. You're not a Hindu if you say that. You're not a Christian if you say that. Oh, sorry. Oh. And then there's politics. Oh, you're not a Republican. Oh, you. You're not a Republican if you say that. You're not a Democrat. You're not this. You're not that. Oh. Oh, I'm a, I'm a black person. I'm a Jewish person. I'm an Arab person. I'm a middle class Englishman. That's who I am. It's my race. Boom. What is, what is, what is, what is, what is identifying? Not, you know, experiencing being in a race and ex enjoying it and all that stuff. I like being an Australian and all that stuff. No problem with that. As long as you realize it's an experience. Once you identify with being the race, you are identifying with being the body, which means you're identifying with being Charlie Smith and Ethel Jones. Gotcha. Which brings us to self-identity which is the key one. Stop them understanding who they really are because then we're right up the swanny. As Mark Twain said, in religion and politics, people's beliefs and convictions are in almost every case gotten at second hand and without examination from authorities who have not themselves examined the questions at issue but have taken them at second hand from other non-examiners whose opinions about them were not worth a brass farthing. That's how belief systems come about. The earth's not round, you're mad. By the way, if, 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 if there are people here, I'm sure they must be, who never heard my stuff before, all the very best. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're going to go into some very strange places <laughs> before this day is out. <laughs> He's just said the Queen's a lizard. He couldn't have done. He couldn't have said that. He did. He did. <laughs> anyway, this is a great way that we're held in belief systems. Cognitive dissonance. I love this one. It's really, really uh, uh, important. Lying to yourself. Cognitive dissonance, for people who haven't come across it, is a, a, a state of anxiety. I've seen people in it state of anxiety um, when their belief system and their experience or what they're hearing in terms of information are at odds. Now, cognitive dissonance is a very good thing because when you go into this anxiety state, you can look at the information and look at the experience, realize there's more to know about your belief system, and you move on. But what most people do is the belief system's immovable. Not to be touched. So what they then do is um, try to find ways to explain away the uh, uh, experience or the new information so the belief system remains intact. And th it's from cognitive dissonance that we get these incredible mind contradictions. For instance, we're going to war to fight for peace. 
cognitive dissonance, classic. And uh, George Orwell talked in his book 1984 about doublethink, which again is a, a form of cognitive dissonance to, to square the circle. Double think means the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. Fighting for peace. And that's where this comes from. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. And only by persuading us to take on these contradictions and accept them as real can the few control the many. And the idea, and my goodness me, they've got so many people in this world, in this state, the idea is to keep us in a total and constant state of confusion. Thinking the world is sane when it's utterly crazy. Like doctors destroying health, when you realize what the game is, when you've connected enough dots... That is not a contradiction at all anymore. It's only a contradiction when you don't know what the game is. Doctors destroy health because it's about wealth, not health. Pharmaceutical companies are not there to bring um, health to the population. They're there to scam them on one level for vast amounts of money. They're not interested in curing people of cancer. They're making too much money uh, treating the symptoms in this assisted suicide we call chemotherapy. And also, to so drug the population in various and many ways that again, our ability to think straight and sharply um, is uh, destroyed. This guy, William Osler, Canadian physician, he said, one of the first duties of the physician is to educate the masses not to take medicine. I like him. I like him. I don't know why he said it, but it's true. <laughs> Lawyers destroy justice. Of course they do. Because if we live in a just and fair society in which everyone is treated the same, the few do not have the privileges through law to stitch up the population and the system in general. So, of course, lawyers are there to destroy justice. Universities destroy knowledge. Again, of course, the last thing you want, if you're the few and you want to control the many, is a sharp thinking, intelligent, aware population. Worst bloody nightmare. So right the way through, from what we call uh, the education system, people are not educated, they are indoctrinated with a version of life and reality and the world that suits the system to keep the few in servitude. And I feel for young people today because they are being bombarded, especially at this time of awakening, and that's no coincidence either, they're being bombarded on multi-levels to keep them asleep and to keep them from opening them, their minds to see the full magnitude of who, who they are. And all around the world, education is celebrated. Oh, yes, we're bringing it, education to the third world. If only. Just more indoctrination into the same global system that we're all supposed to worship. Governments destroy freedom. This is the great one. If, you know, if people are new to this, this is the big, first big step. Governments are not there to serve the people. Governments are there to serve those that control the governments and enslave the people. That's what they're there for. Once we realize that, then a lot of dots start to connect. Men in dark suits. They, they're, they're everywhere, these people. They breed. It's like luminous jackets. They're everywhere. Men in dark suits front men for a force that I'll get into who are running the system on behalf of those that control the system and not for the people, which is why the decisions are against the interests of the people. It's real simple once you know what's going on. And they come from... 
And they come from certain interbreeding bloodlines. You know, this guy is um, uh, one of them. Shows what interbreeding too closely can do for you, really. Oh, Georgie. Boy, Georgie. And it just really is a, a confirmation of just how ludicrous this system's become and just how much control the people have, uh, 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 do, do not have, 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 have lost, that a complete idiot can become president of the United States in the way that this man did. It says so much. You can see it down the back here at a news conference. He's got the wire, you know. Mr. President, could you uh, answer a question? Okay, go ahead. Yeah? Our enemies are innovative and resourceful, and so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people, and neither do we. <laughs> President of the United States, the so-called most powerful country in the world, and that man can become leader. And now, And now, the power of persuasion. A man who was spawned from the most corrupt political system in America, Chicago, has become the Messiah for the world in the minds of so many people. When the guy is just the political equivalent of a used car salesman, come in here to sell an agenda with a smile on his face. And while we stand by and allow this to happen, our freedoms and freedom of speech is being taken away, our ability to uh, even interact with these people is being, uh, being eradicated as we have the free speech zones and all this stuff. And an agenda to enslave humanity in the next few years in uh, terms of its, uh, the, 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 the direction it wants to go in terms of its full-scale control unfolds all the time. And these people are fundamentally responsible. Major media destroy information. If we had a mainstream media that even vaguely associated itself with the true meaning of the word journalism, none of this would be possible. But the same people that control the politicians own the media. And so the media is not there, just like governments, to serve the interests and inform the people. It is there to tell the people what those who own the media want them to believe. Write what you're told. Thanks, nation builders. We couldn't control the people without you. And no, they couldn't. And, I, and I, I, I'll say this to journalists. I said it years ago, and they laughed. And one or two of them are not laughing so much now. You, you and your children and grandchildren are going to have to live in the world that you're helping to bring in by just being, as one editor described journalism, just being intellectual prostitutes instead of real journalists investigating and telling real news. And then finally, <laughs> and then finally, religions destroy spirituality. Of course they do. Because the, what my father used to call bricks and mortar religion uh, are there to sell and enslave people within a belief system and also to create division between different belief systems called religions. So people are so focused on, on one belief and battling for their belief to have preeminence that they don't deep breath, take a step back, look at it again. Oh my God, I'm all that is, has been, and ever will be. Religions are not there to find spirituality for want of a word. I'm not sure I like that word very much. They're there to stop us getting to spirituality overwhelmingly when you get to the top of them. So we have this crazy world and it gets crazier the idea is to keep us so focused on survival 
It's like that uh, mass mind control manual that came to light a few years ago called Silent Weapons for a Quiet War, How to Manipulate the Population. And one of the lines in it said, keep them busy, busy, busy back on the farm with the other animals. So the more you can keep us in a state of survival, more and more stress. Look, mate, I, I, you might be saying interesting things, but I, I, I live in the real world, mate. Boom. That's the idea, to keep us in that state of stress. And we're now bringing it to younger and younger people. People, kids under tremendous stress to pass exams, to show how indoctrinated they are in the system. Oh, you got, must pass your exams. Oh, my son got a, oh, sorry, I've seen it on car stickers. My son got so and so, so and so. I'm very pleased for you. By the way, he got it, you didn't. <laughs> this parental glory seeking. Oh, go, you've got to pass your exams. You're going to be a banker. Your mum wants you to be a banker. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Whatever happened to life? How do you spell happy, teacher? I mean, what's all that about? Do we ever talk about that? Are you happy? Are you fulfilled? You know, pe people, we have these um, measurements of success that are sold to us that we take on. And they're all about more. More and more and more. How more, many more people are this? How many more people are that? How many more people are this? How many more people have passed degrees? How many more people have got a mortgage? How many more people? And yet, it's the other way that tells the real story. How few people are unfulfilled. How few people are under stress. How few people are ill. How few people are homeless. How few people are terrified of the future. These are the, the measurements of a success of society, surely. Not more and more and more. You know, we have, we have an economic system, which I call take, make, and throw away, where the whole thing of success, it's called economic growth, is how fast you can take from the earth, turn it into things, sell more things, throw away more things, and start again. The faster you do that, the more successful you are. And we call it the cutting edge of human society. It's turn, turning the, 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 the planet into a shite hole. And we have um, the cleverness up to a point, although if we went to wisdom, we would find that technologically we would advance by enormous strides. But we have the cleverness through mind at the moment to create some amazing technology. Things that could make the world a better place for everybody. But we use that technology to pepper bomb cities full of civilians. We are now such at the cutting edge of human evolution that we can kill more people than ever before. And we do. We're in a world where it seems okay for children to sign their names on bombs that then drop and kill other children. Like I say, we think the world is sane. Well, we people in this room don't, but so many people do when it is utterly insane. And what keeps people from understanding this? The constant hypnotic trance that we put in. You are feeling sleepy. Tick tock, tick tock. You don't want to know about pepper bombing cities. Watch this, shut up. <laughs> Quick, honey, uh, she's going for the car. Whoa. <laughs> We live in a world of plenty, and yet people starve for the want of the basics. We have food galore in some parts of the world, which comes often from the parts of the world that go hungry. And we throw away more food than most people eat in many, many months. I've seen this. I've seen this in Ecuador. People living on rubbish tips, waiting for the uh, vans to come from the Western hotels to pour the, 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 the rubbish food, throwing away food on, and then they go and eat for the day from it. The world that we have allowed to happen. But don't look at that. Tick tock, tick tock. Look at this. Shut up. Hey, quick, honey. The Steelers are going to score. 
cool, yeah, yeah. I've got nothing against that. I love sport. But if we are in a situation where that becomes the focus of our reality at the exclusion of everything else, then while we're looking here, hell is going on here to stitch us up in the way that we have been. Oh, shut up. What's on the telly, honey? And then we, 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 we drop bombs on the most crowded piece of land on the earth, Gaza. We protect ourselves. That's what we're doing. We do it to protect ourselves, apparently. This is what we do. This is liberation. Yay, liberation. And it's been going on. This is, this is Vietnam. In the 20th century, humans killed well in excess of 100 million other humans in wars and conflicts. And it's still going on. Tick tock, tick tock. Well, you don't want to see that. Hey, quick, honey. Paris Hilton's half naked in the back of a limousine. Come and look. It's really good. <laughs> and that's the, uh, that's the new religion. Instead of living life, hey, this is me. I'm going to live my life. Ooh, isn't that she got a nice dress on? on that, 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 this show, isn't she? And stuff. <laughs> oh, look, she's going to marry so and so. Oh, they've been divorced, are you? It's the new religion. The celebrity. The religion of celebrity. I'm just in the supermarket. Oh, yeah, I'm getting some beans. They're up there. They don't have to shop in the supermarket. Because they're different. And then we have a situation where... We have a system called money, which is based on money that has never, does not, and will never exist. Steps back in amazement to say it again. I didn't quite catch that. We have become so divorced from the world that we live in that most people never ask the simple question, what is money? When you go into a bank and you ask for a loan, $50,000 or something, what does the bank do? It does nothing in terms of moving precious metal anywhere, printing money, anything. It just types into your account $50,000. And from that moment on, you start paying back interest, and eventually the principal, if you're lucky, on the $50,000. Because the same people have controlled the politicians and the governments have controlled the banks, legislation has been passed which allows banks to lend at least 10 times, and my God, it's at least 10 times, what they have on deposit. So every time you put a dollar in a bank, you're giving them the... the, uh, Right, legally, to lend 10, 9, 10 dollars. And interestingly, um, when you, say, take out a loan for $50,000, that $50,000 has been given to your computer screen on the basis of someone else putting a fraction of that in the bank. And then you take that $50,000 and maybe you, 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 you give someone $20,000 to buy something. They'll take that $20,000, which has already been created out of nothing, and they'll put it in another bank. Now the $20,000 from the original $50,000 gives this bank the right to lend 10 times the $20,000. And so it goes on. What a, a bank can create out of nothing and charge interest on to the population from $1 or hundred dollars or whatever the figure is, is fantastic. And we don't ask questions. I've talked to economists, you know, who earning cuckoo land amounts of money on the telly and stuff. I say, what is money? How is it created? They can't tell you. They never thought about it. It's just there. It's governments. Isn't it? mm. No. It's the DNA of this society which holds this, si- this society more than anything else in so many ways on a physical level in servitude. Money created out of nothing called debt, credit, which we then spend the rest of our lives paying back. But don't look at that. Don't let them know that. Tick, tick, tick. Hey, quick, honey. It's the Jerry Springer show. This man's going to punch his girlfriend. Come and look, honey. These are all the diversions constantly. And then, of course, these people will tell you, All the news that those that own the media want you to believe is true. It's what news is. And the whole uh, foundation of all of it 
is be afraid, be very afraid. The big bag monster is coming as soon as we've invented him. Keep people in fear. Keep people in uh, states of stress. And crucially, this will have implications as we go through the day. Keep them in a state of surviving. Because while they're doing that, they will be in a state of focus on survival rather than looking at the big picture of what's going on. And so we've reached a point now where we really are at this fork in the road. We can go one way or we can go another, but we have to make a choice between the two and we have to make it now. One way will take us in to a global fascist dictatorship, an Orwellian state, well within the next 10 years. When what we say, what we do, where we go, will be controlled, monitored, and imposed by a police state in every country. We're seeing it unfold by the day. The other choice is that we stop shaking in our shells or shaking in our boots. Stop keeping our heads down because we think it's easier that way. And we start to know thyself. We, are, we start to understand the full, extraordinary magnitude and genius that we really are. When you sweep away, delete the programming that has put us in the state that humanity has become. <laughs> and, and, when, and when you reach that level, you stop taking this nonsense seriously. And when you stop doing that, it stops being intimidating to you. We're told, American word you hear so often, we're told, you must comply. Compliance, that's what it is. The police state, you must comply. You must not incite discord. You must comply. Well, I have this thing. I call it the non-comply dance, you know. And that is when you start to beat to this different drum. And you don't comply. You don't comply with your own enslavement. You don't comply with your own servitude. And we stop building and acquiescing to the building of our own prison. Comply! No. <laughs> Do what we say. No. Your house is foreclosed. Leave. No. <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people in America, I was there for two months recently, hundreds of thousands of people every month are losing their homes. Now, hold on a second here. Let me just follow this round just a little bit. They're losing their homes because they've lost their jobs. They've lost their jobs because of what the banks have done. But now, because they've lost their jobs because of what the banks have done, they can't pay their mortgage to the banks, and so the banks come along and take their home when the banks have caused the problem in the first place. And hundreds of thousands of people in America are leaving their foreclosed homes every month. Why? Stay there. Refuse to leave. Then say to the system, okay, deal with that, darlings. Hundreds of thousands of people every month. You've got to come and take them out of there. Well, we can't. We have of course you haven't. It's only possible for this nonsense, this grotesque injustice to happen because people acquiesce. Oh, well, we better leave. Non-compliance. Ooh, I'm inciting discord. <laughs> Good. we really look in the mirror and see the true reflection of ourselves, this system will collapse. As Martin Luther King said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. We are at that time of challenge and controversy. Where do we stand? Comply or non-compliance? Free your mind from the programming 
that holds us in little me. Free ourselves from the hypnotic trance we've been put in. It's a mad, 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 mad world, yes. But why? Because what has been kept from us crucially, above all else, is who we are, the nature of life, and the nature of the reality that we live in. I started out um, after ridiculously outrageous things happened to me about 20 years ago. The top of my head blew off, and uh, it was uh, uh, never the same again. Thank you, God. Um, I started to ask big questions, because unless we ask the big questions, and most people don't, because we're so focused on survival and, and, and today, uh, surviving another day, you never get the big answers, how can you? And when you ask the big questions, the world looks very different. You start to realize, for instance, that there is a multi-leveled conspiracy to um, enslave humanity on multi-levels, mentally, emotionally, and therefore physically. And some other questions I started to ask, and this is, this is where I want to concentrate on in this, um, uh, this first section, because it's so important, because in the second section, when I get into the the conspiracy as it's unfolding today in our everyday lives, that will start to make so much more sense in terms of why society is as it is, why it's structured as it is, why things are done as they are, once we realize um, what uh, reality is. Who are we? Where are we? What is reality? What is life? How many people in the world actually ask that in their entire lifetimes until they get towards the end maybe? And when you ask those questions, you realize it's all an illusion. This physical world that we take so seriously, that we think is so real, is just an illusion decoded by our body computer system to give the illusion of solidity. Great American comedian, Bill Hicks, who said, <laughs> who said this, all matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration. We are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There's no such thing as death. Life is only a dream, and we are the imagination of ourselves. Encapsulates it. And really, the bottom line of the conspiracy is to manipulate our imagination of ourselves so that we imagine ourselves to be little me and powerless, and therefore controllable by the few. It's all an illusion. It sounds crazy to start with, but I, I, for the one and only time in my life in 2003 in the Brazilian rainforest, I took uh, this, this uh, psychoactive uh, rainforest plant called ayahuasca. And, <laughs> and uh, some people have a bad experience. I had a fantastic experience. For five hours, this female voice it took the, took the, the theme of, uh, or the, the uh, expression of, this female voice, as loud as mine is now, took me, uh, talked to me for five hours about the nature of reality and how it was all an illusion, explaining why it was an all illusion. And it was hilarious. I mean, my feet were literally in the air a number of times. It was so funny, because it is funny when you realize what we take seriously. Um, and I came back after that, and I started looking in the scientific area and quantum physics and all this stuff to see um, if I could um, support what that uh, voice had said um, from the mainstream science and the, the cutting edge of science. And I found that you could do it easily. Why? Because science is a series of disciplines, vast numbers of disciplines, and the buggers never talk to each other. They don't connect their own dots within science. Why? Because they're not encouraged to. Indeed, the opposite from encouraged to, because once they connect the dots, woo, this is life then. And you, 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 when you do connect the dots, you realize that if they did, they'd already realize that this reality is an illusion. I, was, uh, I talked in, um, in London in May last year, and a friend of mine who uh, is a healer and he, he, a, a scientist and he works in scientific circles, and he'd uh, done this presentation or, or been at this event at the Royal Society, like the, the holy grail of science, mainstream science in London. And he's met all these people, and he comes to my talk, right? You know, I mean, I left school at 15 to play uh, soccer. You know, I never passed an exam in my life. Thank you, God. Okay, so, and 
He met four or five of these guys who'd been at the Royal Society, mainstream scientists, and he said, what the hell are you doing here? And they said, well, we've come to hear it how it really is. Because they bloody knew this. But if they talked about it within their, their um, science, within their discipline, within their arena, the funding stops, the ridicule starts, and they no longer um, are able to progress within the mainstream science. Why? Why do you want to? Follow what is. So, all the time we are decoding reality in an apparently solid three-dimensional way. This is an amazing guy. You might have seen some of these on the internet. This is an amazing guy who draws uh, chalk pictures on the pavement. And all the pictures you're going to see are on a flat pavement. But because of the way he draws them... He gets the brain to decode them in a three-dimensional form. He's tricking the brain into doing this. These are all on flat pavements. Incredible guy, what he does. And, and here's another example. Because the brain is decoding reality, and you can manipulate that, and that's another big thing of the conspiracy, which I'll get to. All these things are... Optical illusions, tricking the brain to read reality in a certain way. And it could be done on a very deep level, and it is. Again, is that a, a, a seven-section uh, box, or, is it a, 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 or image, or is it a box, or what is it? It depends how your brain reads it. Uh, most people seeing this for the first time will read that as a bird in the bush. Actually, it says a bird in the, the bush. Uh, because the brain is used to certain things... You can drop things in that are there, but it doesn't read them because it reads according to the program that it's taken on. Uh, these uh, kind of red colors are exactly the same, but because of their relationship to other colors, the brain reads them differently, and they appear to be not the same, but they are. As Einstein said, reality is an illusion, albeit a persistent one. And the reason for its persistence will become clear before we finish this first section. So I, I, I followed this amazing synchronicity that suddenly appeared in my life 20 years ago. And it took me through the five sense level of this and how secret societies connect and all that stuff. I'll get into that in the second sex section. And then it took me through interdimensional stuff. And eventually, from 2003 onwards, with that ayahuasca thing, right up to the present day, the whole focus of where, where my life has gone uh, is the nature of reality and who we are and all that stuff because this is, the, this, is the, this is the place where the key to open the door is. And, you know, it's great that, we, we, that there are all this conspiracy research going on um, it, on the level of, you know, engineered wars and stuff and, and backgrounds to Obama. It's very important that we know this. But if we only do that, then we're just learning more and more and more about our own prison. This stuff uh, sh can show us how to open the door, open the cell door. So when you ask the question, where are we? We're in a virtual reality universe. In so many ways now, technology, although on a far more basic level, is starting to mirror the reality we're actually experiencing. I saw this um, cartoon. I thought, I thought it was very apt. The universe is amazing, isn't it, Captain? It's very mysterious. A lot of things we don't know about, like dark matter, dark energy, multiverses. System error, reboot, reloading universe. We know less than you think. And although that's a kind of simple kind of analogy, that is basically what we're looking at, a virtual reality universe of incredible sophistication compared with the virtual reality that we have in this world now, but the theme is just the same. Even in this comparatively uh, Stone Age level, a virtual reality that we're in at the moment, things are getting more and more sophisticated and the quality of the images are getting uh, more and more advanced. And if we keep going on this level f into the far uh, distance as we perceive distance and perceive future, um, we'd end up with something like this eventually. This guy here, uh, part of him is the real him, part of him is the uh, virtual reality him. And again, 
the theme is just the same. Our virtual reality is getting more and more. I mean, there's more and more virtual reality simulations to teach people how to do things. Um, and uh, uh, films like, uh, like this stuff to um, help soldiers train and all that stuff. And flying simulations. And this is uh, in a hospital where they put people on a virtual reality uh, system when they're uh, treating their burns. And the virtual reality is feeding them uh, things that are images that are very cold, which the brain is reading and decoding. And it makes uh, the, the, the pain of the, the, the dressing, etc., far less than it would be because the brain's not decoding this to the extent that it would because it's also decoding, decoding the opposite to it through the virtual reality. And what is virtual reality? These games. You have the goggles that use the eyes sense. You have the gloves that use the touch sense. The virtual reality games that we are using and the more advanced ones are simply mirroring reality. They're mirroring the five senses and using the five senses. Because what the five senses are doing is receiving vibrational information. It's what they do. I mean, the ear is the obvious one with sound, but they're all receiving vibrational information, turning it into electrical signals, another form of the same information, passing it to the brain, which then decodes that into the world we think is out there, but actually this only exists in here. We talk about space and distance, but when you look into the night sky and you see all those stars, all those lights from stars are where they used to be, anyway, and they seem so far away. And yet, the only place they exist in that form is in our decoding system that turns them into an apparent physical world. So that's where the world exists. Imagine if you are the few and you know that, and you keep that understanding from the population. And you know that all you've got to do is manipulate the population's decoding system and they will experience the reality you've manipulated them to decode. That's what's going on. That's why it's kept from us the true nature of the reality we're living in. Because then we become controllable. This is absolutely right in the matrix. This isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, taste, and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. That's what it is. The world we think is out here only exists in here. And that is a fundamental revelation to understanding how the few control the many. On one level, this reality is digital. It's a digital reality on one level. It's vibrational on another one. There's many levels of it. And it's a decoded world in terms of its physicality. The body is a computer, a biological computer. By biological, I mean it has the ability to think for itself. It's not that it's just reacting to data in the way that it's programmed to react to data, it has the ability to think for itself, certainly up to a point. And the key level of the conspiracy is to get us to believe that we are the computer and therefore forget that we are that which is working through the computer, consciousness, false identity. So, who are we? Big question. We think we're humans. We think we are Joe Bloggs and Bill Jones. But that's an experience. What we call human is an experience. It's not who we are. 
we are consciousness, energy, consciousness, having the experience. This is the vehicle to experience this reality. If, if, um, if I want to experience uh, Radio 1, I have to get a vehicle, a radio, that is tuned to Radio 1. Otherwise, I can't access and experience it. Same with this reality. Our consciousness is, is vibrating too fast. Eventually, if you go high enough within consciousness, it's not vibrating at all. But it's vibrating too fast to interact. I couldn't pick this up. My consciousness couldn't pick this up because the difference between this frequency and my consciousness is too great. So we take on a vehicle which is vibrating within the frequency range of this reality and then I can interact with it. They've kidded us that the vehicle is who we are. And that's why we see ourselves in such limited terms. We are multi-level consciousness. Extraordinary, infinite genius. On the lower levels of this multi-level consciousness, it's actually photographable now. The things like curly and photography and such techniques. We are energy. And this is my mum. She, um, she died a few years ago. And I had this experience um, on the day of the funeral, which really gave me this profound insight into who we are. Um, I've not, funnily enough, I, you know, I got to uh, my age a few years ago. I'd never seen a dead body ever. Um, just never been my experience. But um, my brother said to me, oh, would you like to see your, your mother in the... In the, in the open coffin, in the uh, funeral parlor. And my immediate reaction was, no, I don't need to see that. I remember as she was. She's consciousness anyway. But then something said to me, go, go, go. And this intuitive level which says things like that, I never deny because it's taken me into so many amazing places I wouldn't have gone otherwise. And I went. And there was my mother in this open coffin. And it sounds saying the obvious, but... That body was dead. I've never seen anything so dead in my life. It was, uh, there was, it was completely lifeless. And next to it was this picture, massive blown up picture, which my brother was going to put um, in the funeral service. And I've stood there and I'm looking at this dead, dead body. And I'm looking at this picture. And this picture's alive. Because photographs... Uh, can pick up the energy um, of us as well as just the physical. And the sparkle, the energy that's coming off that picture was not coming off that body. The energy that's coming off that picture and not off that body, that is what had left. And that's why the, 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 such a lifeless thing was left behind. The computer, that's all it was. That life force is who we are. And you see this um, and experience this through people who have what we call near-death experiences. When they leave the body, or the body dies, and then the body's revived, and they find themselves back in the body, and often they talk about going through the, the tunnel and all the rest of it. And this is what one near-death experiencer said about what he experienced in that out-of-body state. Everything from the beginning, my birth, my ancestors, my children, my wife, everything comes together simultaneously. I saw everything about me and about everyone who was around me. I saw everything they were thinking now, what they thought then, what was happening before, what was happening now. There is no time, there is no sequence of events, no such thing as limitation of distance, of period, of time, of place. I could be anywhere I wanted to be simultaneously. That is who we really are. That's who we really are, and that's what this conspiracy, in its bottom foundation uh, level, is seeking to, and must to prosper, keep from us. And that's why this uh, knowledge is so suppressed through the, through the uh, ages, and religion has played a massive part in suppressing this. We think we're the body, but it's the vehicle. Einstein said, this delusion is a kind of prison for us. 
restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from the prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. In other words, once we lose the idea that we are individual little me and realize we are all that is, we start to connect again with all that is and not just with a few people around us who um, connect into our sense of individuality and Ethel Jones and Charlie Smith. Any picture of this uh, theme, this um, type, is from a guy called Neil Haig. He's a great friend of mine in England, an artist, and he's a very, very original artist. And he has this unbelievable ability to not quite read my mind, because I do explain what I want and, and what I'd like him to portray and stuff, but he has this wonderful ability to then deliver a picture, and I go, crikey, if I was an artist, and I'm shite, um, I... <laughs> I would draw it exactly like that. That's what was in my mind. It's an amazing connection that we seem to have. And this is the difference, um, a real important difference that I want to make. Okay, again, it's all words and it's how they're defined. I'm going to define the words for this day. Consciousness is the word I'm using for what we really are. All that is, has been, ever will be. And consciousness has an experience within this reality if it chooses to. However, as I said about we must take on a shell and all that stuff to interact um, with this reality, it's very similar to if you want to go on the internet, you can't just sit there in a chair on an empty desk and go on the internet. You need a conduit. You need an interface through which you can access that Collective reality, we call the World Wide Web, and it's called a computer. What consciousness does is exactly the same in a fantastically more sophisticated way. It takes on what I call the biological computer, the body, to, as its interface. And the body and its immediate energy field, I'm calling the mind. And, and the the is very important. Because for me, the more that I kind of start to understand this, we talk about my mind.